Given the fact that you're building the world's biggest wind farm in a town called Pampa, Texas, don't you and your investors stand to gain a tremendous amount financially if, in fact, this kind of energy increases in this country? Well, we don't, we're not going to do it to lose money. You know that. That's not my history. And so, but what you do have is that there's plenty of room for others to do exactly the same thing with exactly the same terms I have. So by getting in at the point I did, I'm not getting in front of the crowd. There's, there's so much room. We're going to, the total of that quarter, we're going to do 4,000 megawatts. The total of that quarter could easily do 400,000 megawatts. But you yourself have no qualms about having a vested interest in this venture. You mean from a conflict of interest standpoint? No, no, just that you will gain financially. And no. It, it, that's part of this campaign, and that's okay with you. Oh, absolutely is. I, I think it's uh, everything I'm doing is, is fair and above board, as if that's the question. And uh, but here, what you're going to do is you're going to you're going to use the wind for power generation, and that's going to free up natural gas. And that natural gas, according to your theory, can then be used to power cars and other vehicles your in car. this country. Do we have the capacity and the distribution system and the models of cars necessary to use natural gas in a really significant way? Not completely, but let's go to the cars first. General Motors has 25 cars they build for natural gas, but all of them are foreign, South America, Europe, none in the United States. They could build those here just as easy as they build them there. So cars could be available pretty quick. You're gonna you're gonna focus on the bigger equipment though, uh, uh, heavy duty, uh, medium and heavy duty trucks and buses and all. That's the better ones. But there are eight million vehicles in the world today on natural gas. Uh, natural gas is half the price of gasoline. And that's what you're replacing. And if we took that that little uh, pie out of the power generation pie, that that would be the natural gas would go to, to transportation fuel, it would reduce our imports by 38 percent, which would save us $300 billion a year in this country. Have you talked to U.S. automakers about this? Do they seem receptive to this plan? And are they willing to manufacture vehicles that will, in fact, use natural gas? Now, remember, General Motors has 25. Right, but more in this country. The Ford does, too, in Chrysler. They, what they say to me is, look, you get a market for us and we'll build the car. Are you trying to become the Al Gore of energy independence? Talked to Al last week. Yeah. We had a one hour conversation about energy, green, clean, renewable, all these things. I am more focused not on green, I'm more focused on the seven hundred billion dollars that's going out of the country. And so I'm not opposed to any uh, uh, Al, I don't think he likes uh, drilling in the offshore. I, I'm for drilling in the offshore. I'm for doing anything we can to reduce that dependency. You worked hard and contributed millions of dollars to defeat Al Gore back in 2000, of course. What do you think of him today? He never even mentioned that. No, but what do you <laughs> think of him? <laughs> well, I think Al's a good guy. I mean, we, we agree on, on energy and clean because natural gas is clean and we have an abundance of it in this country. It's cheap. So I'm for that. Al's not opposed to that, and it's uh, and I, but I, I think we on this subject we're in pretty good agreement on it. Having supported President Bush in 2000 and 2004, has he disappointed you in terms of his energy policy? Well, you know, I'd have to say that that uh, I wish that he had uh, had seen what I believe I see about natural gas. Natural gas is really the only one of our natural resources in this country that can actually replace uh, foreign oil and uh, gasoline. And he uh, went the direction of ethanol, which I was not that interested in ethanol. Do you think he was too focused on ethanol as, as an alternative source of fuel? Well, he, he, wasn't, uh, he wasn't focused on natural gas, 
and that that was my focus and uh, yes I think he was too focused on ethanol. Have you had any conversations with President Bush about your interest in this area and about your plan? Yes and I have. What did he say? Oh he was interested and uh, and we had a had a long conversation about it and and I went through my whiteboard presentation and all and he seemed to have interest in it but uh, maybe just that day. <laughs> You don't think his interest is long-term or sincere? Well, the uh, I, I don't uh, I don't I don't I don't want to use sincere in that description. I just say that maybe he saw better alternatives than than I had to offer. Why do you think oil is so high? Because we peaked on oil production, and we're 85 million barrels a day is what the world produces and you have a demand of 86.4. So 85 won't cover 86.4. And consequently, it's kind of bidding for the marginal barrel. And when you're competing against uh, China, India, uh, and all the developing countries, uh, they bid the price up is kind of the way it goes. You say in your presentation about this that it all comes down to the right leadership. Who do you think is the best candidate to help Americans and, and lose their addiction to foreign oil? Well, are we down to presidential candidates? Yes. Between uh, the two senators? Right. Okay, I said I'm sitting out this, and I, I don't think my plan will be totally accepted as far as a serious plan if I am supporting, as usual, Republicans. The, uh, and so uh, I'm not, I, I say this is nonpartisan, and I have not put any money in this presidential race. In the past, haven't you said you were supporting John McCain? Yeah, I'll vote for him, I said. But I'm not working in his behalf because I think my program is the number one issue in this presidential campaign, and it hasn't been elevated by either candidate to that level. I mean, I've never heard one of them say that we have an outflow of $700 billion a year. They don't mention it. You say you're going to set out this campaign in terms of being a vocal supporter of either candidate, even though you have admitted you will vote for John McCain. But that wasn't the case in 2004. You gave $3 million to the Swift Boat Veterans against and their campaign against John Kerry. Oh, it was more than that. How much? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think it was closer to six. All right. All right. Thank you for the clarification. Last November, you were quoted as saying at a dinner that you would pay $1 million to anyone who could show that anything that group said was false. No. What I said was that any that there were any errors in the nine ads that I paid were for. Were you specific about the nine ads, though? When you made that statement, I, you got you. I think I was because the question, the way it came up, was about an ad, and I, I said if there's anything because they've come back to me with uh, the book that John O'Neill wrote and Winter Soldier and everything. I, I didn't have anything to do with those books. The only place I put the money was on the was on the nine ads. And John Kerry said, "Okay, I'll take you up on that." If he shows anything in those ads as false, you'll or anyone absolutely, does, you'll, I will you'll on, put on, out the one million dollars. Absolutely on the ads. He keeps calling it a bet. It's not a bet. A bet's where I can win or he can win. I just said if you can show me an error in any of the nine ads that I paid for, that I'll I'll pay a million dollars. Six million dollars. Why did you give that amount of money to this group, Swift? Boat veterans for for truth. Why was that so important to you? I didn't want him to be president. I wanted the American people to see John Kerry like I saw John Kerry. And why specifically was the depiction of his war record during Vietnam so important to you? Well, they see seventy one. He he gave the uh, speech before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And that's where he said that our soldiers maimed, they murdered, uh, they dismembered, they raped, and all those things. And I didn't believe any of that. I didn't think it was true. And then after some of the Swift Boat guys came to see me, and they served with him, 
and all, I didn't think that, uh, that Senator Kerry uh, was qualified to be President of the United States. And then when he negotiated with the North Vietnamese, uh, I thought that uh, was very bad. Now, the last point though, in 1978, he was given an honorable discharge, but he got out of the service in 71. But President Carter gave him an honorable discharge in 1978. And I, I wonder what his status was from 71 to 78. That bothered me. Giving $6 million to the Swift Boat Veterans Campaign against John Kerry uh, was obviously important to you, but now the term Swift Boating has become part of the vernacular to describe a, a malicious orchestrated campaign against someone's record. That is the way it's described by liberals. And the Swift Boat were all, uh, they were heroes for America. And uh, I know those guys. I've been to their conventions. I know them very well. And they were also associated with the POWs. And the POWs' wives were convinced that by Senator Kerry's actions back in 71, 72, trying to deal with the North Vietnamese cost their husbands another year in prison. So the POWs and the Swift Boat people, those are serious people. I mean, you'd like every one of them. They're so you feel as if it was a noble effort, not dirty politics. That's how you would describe it. That it was a noble effort to what? The Swift Boat Veterans for Truth, that that was representative of a noble effort, not dirty politics. Oh, I, there wasn't anything dirty about it. It was facts. That's all it was, was facts. It was nobody has ever, uh, you know, uh, exposed anything there that was dishonest or, or dirty politics. As they, you, didn't, they didn't like it, of course, but it, those were the facts.